Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that all of you are enjoying the Internet 2.0 conference. Now we will be continuing with another panel discussion and the topic is balancing technical excellence and leadership going into the role of a tech founder. So for this, I would like to call upon our moderator and it is Dr. Jagdeep Pambra on stage, please. Can we have him on stage? Okay. He is the co-founder and CTO of Mantra Words, Dr. Jagdeep Pambra. And our panelists, I would like to invite Yazad, Mr. Yazad on stage, please. The general manager, Technology in IT, Sarigama India Limited. And lastly, I would like to welcome Muhammad Al Masiri, the founder, partner, Grow and More Business Consultant. All of you, please put your hands together for Muhammad Al Masiri. So we will be having a very interesting panel discussion. So all of you, enjoy and enjoy. Um, so firstly, yeah, thank you and uh, good morning to everyone. So we've got a very illustrious panel here. And uh, as the topic says, it's a, it's a combination of, kind of how do you understand and balance leadership, technical excellence, but also how do you kind of move into the world of purpose, uh, of practice. Um, we've got um, experts from multiple sectors. So I think uh, the best thing to do is probably start with the introduction. Um, so please proceed. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Yasad. Um, I'm uh, I'm with a company called Sarigama. It is India's oldest and largest um, music label. I've been in the software engineering field for the past uh, 23 years now. Uh, I've been with Sarigama for the past uh, 10 years, and this is the extent of my experience in media and entertainment industry. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tamil Um I'm a consultant, and that thing that means I cannot keep a job for too long. So I'm jumping between jobs and industries for as long as I can remember. Uh, I've been blessed to be in good positions and leadership positions. I've worked in multiple industries, uh, IT, healthcare, education, and recently startups. So. Um, being a, a consultant means you have to engage with people, and this is my number one passion. My number two passion is knowledge. I always like to learn new things. So I've learned a lot today, and I'm hoping to also give something that you can be finding useful. And uh, this is a very rich uh, panel, so I'm hoping to be on board. Thank you. OK, great. And a bit about myself. Um, so currently I run uh, four companies in the UK, uh, co-founded and founded them, and uh, three of them were focused in the, um, I would say, technical consultancy advisory space. Uh, my fourth company is focused around publishing and uh, primarily um, preserving Indian heritage. In terms of my background, uh, 20 plus years uh, working across multiple disciplines in IT, uh, but more recently moved into kind of um, uh, business advisory transformation exercises, um, similar to our panel, I've worked across multiple sectors, uh, multiple industries, multiple geographies, and uh, more recently I've been working with banking and finance. Uh, through that, I've delivered uh, six digital banks and wallets around the globe. Um, previously, yeah, I've worked with the Olympics as a chief architect, uh, Samsung Connected Car as a chief architect. Um, as some of you may know, across the border, STC Pay, I was once their chief architect as well. And um, yeah, my main job is to basically make things happen. So it's usually working with C-level, board level members. And the question is, how do you get something out of the door uh, within the parameters that you're working in, be they uh, commercial, regulatory, legal, legislative, uh, within the confines of the geographies, for example, and uh, limitations around the resourcing, etc. But I was working, my aim is to uh, deliver uh, for my clients. 
I do work in a consultancy capacity as well, so that's myself. So I think uh, in terms of uh, getting straight into it, uh, I think a good uh, place to start would be to understand what sort of leadership that you prefer uh, and how do you actually approach leadership generally uh, in, in such a capacity and getting your respective roles. Sure. Uh, for me, um, uh, one of the approaches or the one that I truly follow is a delicate balance between doing it myself and uh, uh, delegating. I truly believe in delegate, delegate, delegate. Uh, it doesn't mean or it doesn't imply that I intend to work less. Uh, probably uh, delegating it to someone who is more equipped, who is uh, technically more sound and more capable of uh, of completing that task in a much efficient manner. Um, a delegation also helps me to identify the underlying problems from a scalability point of view. If I try to do everything myself, I have a finite number of hours in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year. Uh, so that's not going to be scalable at all. Uh, so. Uh, so by delegating or not being able to delegate, it helps me and identify the underlying problems that I might have. That leads to the other part of it is that maybe identifying these problems will help to upskill the team uh, from a technical competencies point of view or from soft skills point of view and uh, wherever it's required, filling up those gaps. So for me, Anything that can be delegated has to be delegated. Uh, and that works fairly well for us. Um, leading in, in technical role and trying to be a leader in, 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 the, in the AI era and the, the internet and all of that is a very hard thing. Now having a technical job itself is very hard. Sometimes you get over squeezed, over pressured, and you just have to finish things by tomorrow in the morning where there is never enough time. And sometimes you have to make yourself look like you're busy because you don't have anything to do. <laughs> I've been in tech, I've done that. We have some good days where it's smooth sailing, we have some hard days. So we have to understand that for the people who we manage, being founders. And you have to know that it's a very high pressure and demanding job. Burnouts can be happening very easily. And also that there is demand for talents everywhere so they can be pushed or being grabbed by somebody but else bought by the competition. So my, I, would, I would always prefer two styles of leadership. One is the human centric that we focus on people because people is what makes the company successful. I mean, when you remember uh, Apple, who do you remember? Steve Jobs. How many years have he, has, has he been gone to for? 10, 12, 13 years? Microsoft. Definitely Bill Gates. How many years have, have, has it been since Bill Gates stepped out of Microsoft? 20, 22 years? It's been a very long time. So we always remember the companies by their founders. There is some kind of a charisma to the founders. So people look at you when you are a founder like you are a big star and you're just a simple human being who needs to eat, needs to go to the bathroom, needs to get a good night's sleep like our friend just gave us a nice story about it. We are human, we make mistakes, we don't always know what we're doing. But they will come to you and for, for refugee and for, for help whenever they need it and we never have enough answers. So being human-centric, and also the other style is very important, is being adaptive. So the, I might be very good uh, in working with deadlines. Some other people, when you give them deadlines, they just get shaky about it. So you have to give them information. Um, I've met some people who are very good in giving, in taking direction, but not getting details. Tell me what you want to do, and I will do it. Some others would need you to specify for them every step on the way. You need to go from A to B, B to C, 
and act up to X, Y, Z. So you have to understand and to adapt with everyone and have to align them with a common denominator of how to uh, do the job, what is required, because as a founder, you don't always have enough time for all of that. But again, like you treat, treat your children, which I think there was a tech company in New York that with that example, that they consider every one of these staff as part of the family. Would you let go of one of your family members? Even if you hit their guts, sorry. Not all family members are joyful and nice people, but they are our family, so we have to adapt with them. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, so I think for myself, uh, just given the, the experiences I've had, my leadership style, I would say if any, has been dependent on what, what situation I'm put in. Um, in some cases, I've had to be a delegate, uh, where I'm actually privileged to work with smart people, where I'm confident that if I delegate, uh, things, things will, be, uh, will be done. In other cases, I have to be very authoritative, simply because that's the culture of the organization I'm working in. And sometimes it's also geographic. Uh, different countries, uh, different cultures, etc. Just um, you know, based upon what I've seen, work in different ways. So you have to contextualize your style of really leadership. In some cases, if you delegate to a team that is looking for a direction, you will struggle. For example, because they're looking to you uh, to actually make stuff happen. Um, in many cases, um, especially for roles that I've been involved in at inception, uh, it's been a more kind of, I'll say, a transformational role. In other words, uh, collaborating, uh, uh, fostering collaboration innovation, uh, making, making people think out of the box. Um, given, um, you know, similar to our uh, you know, esteemed panel, when working as a consultant, it's a very different world to, to working as a, a permanent member of staff. Uh, in some situations, I've, brought, I've been brought in where uh, people are cl close to quitting, um, and you have to turn things around. So simply, it's a bit like the analogy of the battlefield. A great general, you know, you have different types of generals. Some generals have an army that is very good, and uh, they just, make things happen, the magic happens, and a, a general just orchestrates the, the success. But then on the other extreme, you have a general who basically rallies the troops in the, in the face of failure and uh, 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 leads a victory. Those generals are the special ones, and uh, in some cases, that's kind of world which I end up in, is where organizations are at the brink of disaster. They've tried various means, methods to make things happen. They've struggled, and that's kind of where I get called in to actually do a few turnaround and transformational exercises. In some cases, the teams are uh, spread across you know, different parts of the globe, dealing with different cultures, different ways of behaviors. So they, based upon what I've seen, uh, my style has to change and adapt simply to get the success out. So yeah, I'm probably multifaceted from that perspective in terms of working a particular style, but there's principles in there. Uh, I think someone, someone mentioned earlier around adaptability. For example, for uh, yeah, innovation, collaboration in the scenario of uh, the recent COVID pandemic. I've had to deliver at least two banks uh, remotely. And uh, that was a challenge because at least one of the organizations was not even work used to working remotely. And uh, so that was an uphill struggle just to get them to understand that they can actually do a lot of work remotely and uh, not having to be physically in the offices. So the style of leadership had to augment that as well and uh, adapt to that. Okay. So, um, I think uh, just looking at uh, um, you know your respective experiences, I'd say uh, would you provide any examples where you've had to balance the excellence in leadership, just from personal experience in terms of what you've done previously? Uh, in a leadership role, <coughs> we need to uh, focus on a lot of activities, setting a vision, collaboration, uh, adoption, uh, decision making, innovation. Uh, communication. Uh, I would like to spend some time on the part of uh, communication where you focus on the three C's uh, clarity, content, and certainty. Uh, simplicity, uh, as, uh, simplifying complex problems or complex, complex uh, concepts uh, so that everyone can grab on to, understand, participate in. Uh, simplicity, be there's confusion. When confusion evaporates, attraction begins. Simplicity doesn't uh, lend itself to multiplicity of interpretation. And the response to 
to uh, simplify the concepts are not uh, regionally varied, uh, varied or uh, culturally dependent. So if you start breaking down uh, complex processes into simpler terms, uh, it becomes easier uh, to understand and to implement. Uh, one of the examples is uh, when we set up the machine learning center of excellence uh, within Saregama, the AI concept or the entire field had to be broken down into building, bro uh, blo uh, building blocks that were simpler to understand and which the team could uh, participate in. For example, on our website, when someone tries to search for a particular song or for a particular artist, uh, we need to we we needed to build up on the natural language processing algorithms that, that were already there, but we explained it to the team very clearly that's a text classification problem. Uh, we need to identify the entities, the intent of the search, and things like that, and we built on top of it. So I guess uh, that became easier from a product um, management perspective, from technical implementation perspective, as well as from a quality assurance perspective that what we were trying to do and what we were trying to achieve. So I would still emphasize that as, an, uh, as, a, as a leader, uh, communication is, is very, very important. The, the most troubling Area that I've always found in leading and managing people and project is the expectations. I mean, being a founder or being an entrepreneur has been over romanticized. That you'll be your own boss, that you'll have your own time. Working remotely, for instance, you'll be working from home. You'll have the luxury of the time. No, that's not true. <laughs> you, emails will be bombarding you all day long and be expected to be available 24-7. So the issue of matching the expectation with reality is important. Oh, you look a, like a very nice person. Why are you so harsh in meetings? Because we have to get things done. So ma setting the expectations, I mean, if you have technical standards, if you have any kind of standards, like the gentleman spoke in the morning about um, security, uh, also, our good friend spoke to us about simplifying marketing. If you have any stance, put them on the table. Let us all be on the same understanding and let us all work on that. If you have a certain religious aspect, if you have a certain ethical aspect, if you have a certain regulatory aspect, put it on the table and make everyone understand that a deadline or a standard is non-breakable contract. It's not a social contract that we can negotiate. We have to do it because we have. This is the in the area of, of excellence. Now, on the other hand, we have expectations. You have different people coming from different backgrounds. Now, being a tech founder, we have to deal with people from all over the world. You know, you have we have developers from from Asia, we have developers from the States, from the world. Western Eastern Europe are our story by, by, by their, their own. If you have uh, developers from both sides of, of, of Europe, you'll see the difference, and that is only one continent, or you think they are homogeneous. So, setting the expectations is very important, and knowing the stories, there are so, so, so many stories that we can tell about that. But I think that setting the standard, setting the expectation, making it clear that. How are you going to be evaluated? What is a good job and what is not a good job? What is an acceptable job? And giving continuous feedback would also be very useful. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So I think uh, um, a few examples from uh, from my uh, previous background. Um, uh, so to give you uh, a scenario, uh, one shot, I don't know if my co-founder is going to smile at this one. Um, so one example was I was actually called up by a private equity firm back in London, so this is about 10 years ago, and uh, I was asked if I could help them, and the conundrum was that they've actually sold the product to a major brand, and they don't actually have that product, so I've got 10 months to build this product to actually send it to them, and uh, that was a scenario where, uh, from scratch, as a founder uh, for this particular uh, organization, as a CTO, uh, stroke chief architect, um, the task was someone to actually um, design this entire piece of work. 
uh, what it looks like technically, uh, the operating model, how much it will cost to actually make this happen, then hire the team to deliver it, um, then QA, and then start working with the end client to actually make this happen. It was a success, uh, but interestingly, uh, the, the challenges were, you know, some of the challenges included, you have to step out of your comfort zone. So typically, um, you know, working in the technical realm, you, still, you suddenly start getting involved with uh, legislative aspects, regulatory aspects, uh, legal aspects, uh, commercial modeling, PNL. So stepping out of your comfort zone is one of those things that requires um, that kind of adaptive mindset, thinking laterally to say, okay, I'm going to deliver something technical as a CTO, but I have to work within certain boundaries and parameters. So that was a very steep learning curve. Um, another example was actually uh, with the Olympics themselves in 2012. So when I joined, uh, there was literally just myself and my manager. And uh, our job was to deliver London2012.com in under 18 months. That uh, the nature of the Olympics, as you can imagine, the dates don't shift for anyone. So you have a certain, you know, you're time bound. And also there's the, 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 the world is looking at you to deliver something out to the, to the market. And there's approximately 26 other domains that you have to deliver as a result of that. Everything from the tall tree low, mascots, everything that you can associate with the, you know, with the Olympics. It happened, it was a success, but again, you have to step out of your comfort zone. Um, a few other scenarios, uh, you know, when I was asked to deliver the, uh, uh, the unicorn, the, the FinTech unicorn in Saudi Arabia. Uh, interestingly, um, that was a, a, a challenge, of the, it's based on a handshake, to say, can we, can we make this the first one billion pound unicorn in the region, and how do you make it happen? In a region where you, know, you can't use cloud-based services, you're restricted according to a technology vendor, suppliers, partners, third parties. Uh, you have to work remotely in some cases, and your talent is spread across the globe. It happened, it was a success. But again, these are kind of things where, as a founder, CTO, uh, chief architect, you have to step out of the bounds of law. I think the, uh, the, main, the main thing also is, uh, for me personally, I think some of the success has been it is not on the technical side, it's more understanding uh, emotional quotient. In other words, um, looking at the diversity of the culture and actually leveraging, leveraging that to your advantage. So it's understanding what kind of, uh, I would say the proverbial Lego bricks you have to play with, and then understand how best to uh, bring them together to actually have that success. So I'd say probably a golden thread in my career is that I've delivered the impossible. Um, it's not by design, it's just a situation you put in, and the question is, can you make the best out of it? And uh, it's it's uh, my my personality is one that thrives on challenge. I get very bored, very stagnated in a BAU role. Uh, I think there's a comment made earlier about you come into work, you don't do anything, you go home. Uh, but that's something that uh, I think personally it uh, it uh, always aggravates me. But it's something that I can't do with myself in terms of if I don't deliver something on a daily basis or have success, then uh, yeah, that day has actually been a failure in my book. So. Um, I think later on there's a few questions around uh, you know, what would you ask yourself and advise yourself, but those would be some of the things that I'll, you know, I'll mention. So I think in terms of um, uh, the next question, I think this is probably a more honest and open question and a bit of a therapy session for all of us. Is if, if, uh, uh, you know, the question is, what mistakes have you made in the past and what did you learn from them? Um, mistakes would be a long list. Um, uh, uh, recently, or in the past few years, uh, I have realized that we have been too eager to develop uh, systems and uh, uh, products uh, within our company itself, uh, being from the technical side, over enthusiastic about uh, participating in the actual uh, development of it. I will go back to my previous uh, statement that delegate, delegate, delegate. Uh, that's what something I learned uh, after some time is that I need to outsource everything that can be outsourced. Again, that doesn't mean that we intend to work less, just uh, purchase the softwares or the systems. Uh, what happened was that our, our resources are finite. We were just very thinly spread across all of these initiatives that we try to do uh, in-house, which were not core to our business. We
we changed the, the approach. We became more mindful about the projects that we uh, take on, uh, what we develop in-house. Everything has to be core to our business. It might be small, it might be big, it might be integration with Excel, simple things like that, or uh, complex systems like um, machine learning driven algorithms. If it's core to our business, it is happening in-house. If it is not core to our business, it can be outsourced, we will outsource it. So uh, that helped us uh, focus on our business, uh, thrive the way we have uh, from, a, from a company's uh, point of view. We understand our business, not only from the technology side, but how the revenue is generated, how the business happens, what are the business processes that are core to the revenue generation or revenue collection, and we focus on that. One of the, the things that I like to say and to remind myself and also the people around me is the stories of failure. The history is written by those who triumph, by the, those who are victorious, but it's not always written in the right way. Um, so what I have learned from my failures, and alhamdulillah, as my colleagues have said, we have so many failures and we need to celebrate them in a good way. Uh, one contradicting failure that I have learned is that when I work with people who I know, that is very difficult thing. When you work with friends, family, people you already don't have a relationship with, especially in our part of the world where we cherish social connections, it's very painful when there is something wrong. And when you want to hit the, <laughs> the nail, when you have to hammer the nail, it's very painful and sometimes socially it is devastating. On the other side, working with people I don't know, that's also very painful. <laughs> so it's painful on both sides. So what to do? I've created a proper due diligence way that I can examine the service I need, if I'm going to outsource it or if I'm going to use that supplier, how to deal with it, have a criteria and then choose. If it's a friend, it's good, if it's not a friend, then I will have my proper due diligence and I have learned so much out of that because of the mistakes and the thousands and thousands of dollars we have poured down the brain. Another, I think, useful example to mention is trusting that when you dedicate somebody, they will do the job. In many cases, as a founder, you get shocked of the outcome of people, even trustworthy people. It is sincere people. I'm not saying that they are bad people or they are dubious or they want to kill the business. It's just that they do it as they understood or sometimes they get whatever in their way, so they just deliver whatever they want. It's like being a father or a mother. You have to check after your children to leave the room. I just checked out of my hotel room. I always check the room twice. Then I forget the charger, I forget something. You have to check after them as a founder and you have to set a mechanism for that. So a very good story about that, there was a hospital and the head of IT in that hospital, they had a very nice system. He always told his staff, take a backup. Take a backup from the data. Take a backup from the system. Always secure yourself with a, with a secondary backup. So he would check every week. Did you take the backup? Yes, sir, we did. Excellent. And he did that for many, many months. And suddenly, one day when they had an attack, which happens, a cyber attack, the whole system failed and all data were erased. And they were also hijacked and there was a ransom demand. So I told them, everybody panicked. Hospital management went to this IT head and told them what to do. He said, don't worry, I have a backup. He went to his staff, told them, get the backup out. Oh, sir, we, mm, uh, mm, uh, we did not, uh, it was, Two, two months old, and this is a hospital where you have like an, an average of 40, 50 new admissions other than the outpatients every day. So you have hundreds of kids every day. It's two months old. So you talk about thousands of cases that have been lost. So what this smart guy did is that he pulled out the visit. He went to his office and he pulled the copy and told them, put that on the drive, it will work, and I need your resignations on my desk. So again, as a founder, 
as a head, you have to always trust people. People are not bad, but you have to always make sure that the job is done. You have to check after them, like check on your children, on your youngest, because eventually you can delegate the authority, but you, know, you can never delegate the responsibility. Okay, brilliant, thank you. I think uh, lessons learned, uh, one which I learned when they are uh, working remotely is make sure your seven-year-old son isn't pulling faces behind you when you're actually on a web call. Um, and uh, on a more, more serious note, I think in the early days of my career, uh, one was actually learning to hire the right people. And that was a bit of a steep learning curve for me as well, just as, as somebody who's kind of moved from a, a role into a hiring, is, uh, yeah, make sure you, you hire the right people sometimes, there's a tendency to hire people quickly, um, but you suffer later on if you haven't done your homework around um, making sure you get the right people at the right time in the right context. So I think uh, uh, as a leader, one of the key things is how to build the chemistry in the team and how to make sure everybody gels as well. So I think hiring the right people is very, very important. Um, and again, you have to work within the parameters of either commercial, geographies, etc. Um, another one was not to trust my, uh, my gut instinct and my intuition. So I'm a great believer that your subconscious uh, teaches you a lot because your subconscious picks up things that your conscious mind doesn't. And we as human beings translate that into gut instinct. So every time I have not listened to my gut, I've always had some kind of issue later on. So uh, yeah, I think my, my brain is more geared towards uh, thinking with my heart. And my brain takes a, 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 a back seat sometimes. And that understanding how your subconscious works, your gut instinct, um, yeah, it's always been successful when I've actually listened to it. I think the other one also is uh, rather than making mistakes yourself, is learn from other people's mistakes. So what I usually do is when I meet people, um, especially people in a more senior capacity, is learn from them and spend time to listen. Um, and usually my questions are all around what failed, why did it fail, how did it um, it's far better to learn from other people's mistakes than um, you know, create the mistakes yourself. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that's been very important for me is that's also helped me understand kind of diversity as well, different cultures, different behaviors, different patterns. Um, I think the last point I think is very important for me personally is a very long time ago when I started my career in IT, uh, which is very, very different from what I did in, what I did in university, um, my mentor at the time uh, actually told me that uh, it's better to have depth than move up very quickly because if you have depth, um, it means that your experience will shine through. And it depends on your personality, character, intuition, wisdom, etc. how you want to proceed. So the question you ask yourself is, do I want to be somebody with superficial knowledge or do I want somebody to, uh, you know, some, do I want to be someone who has that depth, the character, the experience, the scars? And that's the question I asked myself a very long time ago. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's taken me a while to get to sea level, board level, and uh, you know, even as a, 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 an angel investor in some organizations, it has taken time relative to other individuals, but I, you can't compare yourself to others. Uh, but for my own journey, it's one of those things that at least there is the depth and experience in the scars. I think the scars are something which I'm probably more proud of uh, than the success, successes. Uh, but ultimately, it's one of those things that if you're moving up the chain, you also have to be uh, sure that the team under you understand and empathize uh, with you as well. And in my case, because I've worked in different disciplines within the IT world, I can relate very quickly to developers, testers, uh, operational staff, uh, DevOps, uh, and, and in today's world, we have data scientists, AI, ML, etc. So uh, empathize with the team is far better when the team know that you've done their work once upon a time and you understand what it feels like from their perspective. So there's more likely a relationship and a link, and they're more likely to open up. Um, I think uh, lessons learned also is don't become too unapproachable. Uh, so there's a, there's a challenge in leadership is that you have to maintain your authority but, and, and uh, the ability to people, for people to understand you do sit at a certain level in the, in, the, in the food chain at the company, but at the same time, you're approachable. In other words, uh, your staff, the people who report into you, whether it's going to a matrix manager or otherwise, they're comfortable discussing things with you and that they don't keep things away from you because that's, I've seen that in many organizations when I've landed as a, as a consultant. And as a consultant, the good thing is you're not party to the company politics. And there's people that are more comfortable telling you stuff about the company than people further up the food chain. 
And uh, that's something that I've avoided in organization simply by having a, a relatively flat structure when it comes to the, the, the social element of things. In other words, um, people find it very easy to speak to you and have a chat with you about pretty much anything, providing it's, it's all within, within um, the, the realms of something that's uncomfortable. So um, I think the, the next question I had was also just around um, examples of some modern challenges, future challenges that you see have experience as well in, in your roles as leaders? Okay. Um, I'm in an industry but that is uh, 120 year old. Uh, so I'm in the music industry, the media and entertainment industry. The first song that I was ever recorded in India was in 1904. And from there onwards, it's what uh, Sarigama has as a content. So uh, challenges that we face are not primarily from a regulation or a law point of view, uh, but it mainly comes from the consumers themselves. Uh, consumers, uh, if I see over the last 120 years, uh, the customers would have bought uh, records, then cassettes, then compact discs, CDs, now they listen to or they consume content uh, via OTT apps, YouTube, anywhere and everywhere they can get uh, access to. For us, the bigger change happened is our customers are not our consumers. The customers for a company like Saregama or any music label in India are primarily the OTT players where we license our content to Spotify, uh, Apple Music, uh, Amazon, anyone and everyone who operates out of India. And the consumers are their uh, customers. Uh, that was a big change for us because earlier you could sell the cassette and you knew your customer, they were your consumers. So now from that, perspective or that change, we need to understand what they are consuming, why are they consuming and why are they not uh, consuming. Uh, yesterday there was uh, one session that was stating that uh, the, the company, who, the, the startup that wanted the funding did not even know that there were four uh, competitors already in the market. We track our competition, we track our content on an, on an hourly basis, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. For us, tracking the consumer and how they consume and what they consume is so important that on a monthly basis it will be too late. So from that perspective, we are highly data dependent. Obviously, we are data driven in everything that we do. We process five billion uh, data points on a monthly basis. Uh, we react quickly to where the consumers are, how are they consuming the content. Maybe it's Instagram, maybe it's uh, any of the social media sites. Uh, so we need to focus on that. Uh, we do. Uh, we have been doing that for the past uh, uh, eight years from a data analytics uh, perspective. And uh, pretty much sure it will keep on uh, evolving and uh, we'll just have to keep up with it. I think the, the right question is what is not challenging in, in IT? I mean, the whole world is running like super fast and IT is on the uh, front end of that whole crazy super fast train that is moving around. I mean, Whenever there is something new, like AI, uh, like um, the Internet of Things, it gets both super credit and then gets demonized. De Where AI is going to take over the world and going to, to be Terminator and going to be all white out of this existence. When you get robo robotics, they're going to take over your jobs. They're not going to make humans work. I don't think they said the same thing about factories when the agricultural and the, the industrial revolution happened, and every 
major change is also a cultural change. So what is not challenging? Uh, I don't see what is not challenging. So, but maybe as a founder, to be equipped with this attitude that I'll wake up in the morning, oh, that's a great morning. What kind, what kind of problems are waiting? Let me get my phone. Okay, this failed. This failed. This failed. We have a crash in that. We lost some, some money in that. Okay, okay, now then you take your breakfast with ease and you smile to your wife, to your husband, to your family, and you give them a nice face because they cannot see grunting all day long because they have problems. It's going to be problematic all day long, and this is the life of a founder. So, equipping yourself with the mentality that as a founder, bring me problems. <laughs> I welcome them, I'll embrace them, I'll do the best that I can do. I mean, when COVID hit everybody in the world, tell me that you have a mitigation uh, plan for that. <laughs> tell me that anybody or any country that dealt very well with COVID, none, none. Not the first world, not the second world, not the third world, not any country dealt well with that. And even if they have, none of them were very good in media. And also, I mean, I worked in scientific research and a PhD myself. I've seen how scientists, how scholars, they fight among each other and this profound theoretical field. So, not what is challenging, what is not challenging. Embracing the challenges, that there will always be a challenge. There's always going to be change. Now, I've graduated as a computer science with a bachelor 20 something years ago. What I have learned back then is totally obsolete. They were very happy to teach us C++ and Java. And that was the top edge of the world back then. Today, I'm, I'm seeing things that I'm unable to grasp all of them at once, and I don't think I'm required to grasp them. But when people can approach to you, you're an IT guy. How to fix my mobile? No, I don't know how to do that. I don't fix mobiles. I don't know how to set up it. There's a new app that does X, Y, Z. I haven't heard about it. Really? I haven't seen you on TikTok. Or the other, the other day, I've, I've, I've received an email that we have seen all your videos on TikTok. You look so great. We're ready to promote you. Sorry, I don't have a TikTok account. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I just uh, decided to skip it. Why did you do that? I don't know. I just decided to do that. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed on LinkedIn and other platforms. So what is not challenging? I think that is the question. So the life of, of, of a founder is ups and downs, managing stakeholders from investors, from the society, because they see you as a vicious voucher who want to eat all and take all and make millions and make people suffer and steal their data. <laughs> so this is one side of it. And from others who see you as a multi-millionaire who's making money hands and foot and you are just shoving them <laughs> everywhere. And from your staff who think that you know it all, and from your family who don't see you enough. So it's always going to be challenging. So embracing this, that it's always going to be challenging. It's a very tough field. It's very challenging and demanding. It's very knowledge-based. And there are always going to be younger people who are more eager. There are always going to be people who are smarter. I'm absolutely ready to swear that everybody in this room is smarter than me, but that doesn't make me less smart. Okay, brilliant, thank you. I think uh, uh, from my personal perspective, in terms of the challenges, if, if any, is um, as a founder, CTO, um, is learning to switch off. Um, is sometimes you don't realize that you're working the hours you are, the, the times that you are, and the question is, you have to learn to be kind to yourself. And uh, learning to switch off is very important. And um, I've been privileged that um, I actually enjoy what I do especially with my uh, fourth company, which is kind of focused on uh, my passion, which is kind of preserving Indian culture and heritage. So sometimes the nature of um, something that you enjoy, the passion, means that you're willing to work endless hours, um, which other people would not uh, in, in, in their right minds. So personally speaking, I think the biggest thing is how do you learn to actually uh, take time out, uh, switch off, give your brain a rest, uh, give your body a rest and a break as well. Um, like I said, it's very difficult, especially when you have a passion for something and you want to make things happen because you're putting all the time, the effort, the hours in there. And, um, you know, anyone from the outside will not see that. Uh, it's a bit like any, anybody who's at the peak of their particular profession. No one will see the work and the hard effort gone into it in the background, but they will see the, 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 
the, uh, the efforts, the results of that, but it's only the person who's actually gone through that pain, uh, the suffering, that the, uh, all the sacrifices that people make uh, in order to get there, only that individual will appreciate it. Um, so I think, personally, it's learning actually to switch off every now and then and actually be kind to yourself. So given we've got a couple of minutes to go, um, I think the last question is, uh, if you had to give yourself advice as a leader, what would it be? Uh, for me, it would be on uh, one of the uh, points that you already made, is find a mentor, follow that person, shadow that person, and listen to that person. That person will help you uh, in a lot of ways which you may not really understand at that point in time. Uh, there was one philosophical question that that uh, what would you do if you were offered uh, 15 million US dollars uh, versus an option to go back uh, 20 years with the knowledge uh, that you have as of now? I don't have an answer because I think I would uh, rather go back uh, 20 years. That is the power of knowledge and that is what a mentor would normally bring to you, uh, that is what they would normally try to do. Crash this timeline down for you. The, the learning that will take a few years or maybe even a decade can be brought down really, really fast. So uh, I would suggest uh, if I would want to take my own advice, I would uh, suggest that uh, understand the process, follow the process, and show up uh, every day with the mentor, and uh, it should be. Okay, simple. Uh, stay human, be a human being who's a real human being with all the people. Even if you fire somebody and you have some time to fire somebody, doesn't mean you shouldn't have coffee with them afterwards. So keep that level of humanity in you all the time. Keep it simple. And keep it uh, always focused on being useful, ethical, and good to everyone, not only yourself or your country or your religion, but keep it for all that, uh, that is useful for everyone. I think be having a message, having ethics, having values, and being humane is the main thing that every leader should have. And I, myself, I try to always be that person. Not always successful, but we should always try. Brilliant, thank you. And just to add to those um, you know, brilliant points, I think the, the advice I would probably give, I'd give, I'd give myself is bring people along the journeys. So thank you. Uh, we are, to, we are up, uh, in terms of this particular session, but I think we've got uh, room for a couple of questions from the audience. So if anybody has any questions, we can um, very quickly get them answered. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for the wonderful discussion. Um, specifically, though, uh, Mr. Mohammed, uh, I like the high standards that you said. Um, you said, you know, despite working remotely, you have to set objectives and deadlines and whatnot. But you ended by saying you have to fire someone. It doesn't mean you can have coffee with them. It sounds very simple, but actually, I think you put a lot of effort into actually building that human connection while still setting high standards at the same time. We'd love to learn how you actually do that. Um, yeah, sure, it's, it's uh, difficult. So I've, I've, uh, unfortunately, I have to be in a position uh, quite a few times of actually letting people go. Um, and the conversation I tend to have is uh, I try to leave them in a good place. In other words, uh, to give them a, an opportunity to say, OK, uh, this is not the right place for you but I can help you in your next role or achieve your next, your next success. And uh, there's a point made earlier around mentorship. So uh, the idea is to basically get people on their next journey in a good place. Uh, so I've been uh, thankful that not one person I've let go has actually had some angst against me. It's always been kind of, uh, people have understood why, and the main thing is to understand why people have been let go. Obviously, it's, a very, it's not a very pleasant experience. I've actually been on the receiving end a couple of times very early on in my career as well which is why uh, it's, it's a very difficult uh, you know, situation and, and, and a uh, journey that you have to go through. But the idea is that you have to do uh, good by people. And the point made earlier about being human, um, in the difficult situations, that's when your personality, character, ethics, morality, 
uh, your wisdom uh, comes through is are you willing to uh, have that human conversation with individuals? Obviously, in any role, we all learn, we all evolve. And the question is, uh, if you let someone go, can you help them in their next evolution? And uh, potentially even say that uh, you can stay in touch with them. In some cases, uh, be approachable enough to say, I'll give you a reference. Uh, it might not be the ideal situation of letting someone go, but at least you'll, you'll give them something, something back for the effort and time that they put into that particular role. Because ultimately, anyone who is let go has put time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears in the job. So for that perspective, you always have to be appreciative. Thank you for the question. I think I would answer that in a story like we do. So I'll try to follow you. Uh, there was an experience done, I think, in the UK, uh, that was a while ago. They asked a big group of people, and they showed them multiple faces of celebrity, beauty queens, you name them, of the people who are really in the international standard, they are handsome. So they asked them to choose the nicest haircut, and then the nicest eye, and then the nicest la eyelashes, and nicest nose and what is the most beautiful mouth and then what is the most beautiful shape of the face and they, they took all of these most beautiful highly ranked parts and they put them together on one single face and that face turned out to be very hideous and not nice at all and you find that in a relationship sometimes even in marriages there's a good man there's a very nice lady they're not very good husband and wife. It doesn't mean that one of them is bad, but together they do not synergize. So again, in, in a company you have objectives, you have attitudes, and then you have a team. So when you have somebody who tries to be the alpha, or tries to take over, or tries to be the jack of all trades, and you try to stop them multiple times, sometimes you, you even find your top talented person, and we've done that multiple times, because they are simply taking over everyone and they're breaking the whole spirit. And upon finding them, we saw that the results were tremendously satisfying, and everybody else who were underachievers now, they're eager to take that seat of that leader. So balancing being a human being, and also a, a, a manager, and also a leader, is I think the part of the equation where we don't always do the right thing, but we try to do what is right for the business, because at the end of the day, we have people's money and we have people's time that are both unreplaceable and need to be yeah, Yes, I have a question. Actually, it's completely the opposite of what you just asked, actually. My question is how to keep the talent, especially with the small, smaller teams, for example. As a leader, you know, as a small team, if you have good, talented people, how to keep them loyal to, to you, for example, or loyal to the, to the entity, to the company. What are the best strategies, especially for a smaller team, because if you lose the talent, for example, it's going to be even harder to, to get someone that you spend a lot of time, uh, you know, with them teaching the, the, the culture of the organization and all these type of things. So what are what the best strategy to keep these talented uh, talented people and to, to, to make them uh, loyal to, to the company and, and um, very good question. Um, I think the, the way to approach that personally is, would I want to work for myself? Um, and why would I want to work for myself? And if I ask that question, the question is what skills, qualities, capabilities would I have in order for me to want to work for myself? Um, if you're hiring people, the question is why, why are they willing to join your company? Is it because they see um, your company as a stepping stone? Uh, to something greater? Do they see it as a commercial opportunity? In other words, it's just a salary-based job. Do they see it as an opportunity to maybe move to a different country if it's uh, from, the, from their kind of existing location? So what are their incentives for joining the company in the first place? So that would be coming out as part of the hiring process is are you bringing people into the company who are actually loyal to the idea and the concept of the company and will go the extra mile for you to actually make stuff happen? Or are they just there purely as a job. Uh, in other words, there's nothing actually keeping them in the company other than uh, the fact that they have the usual kind of T's and C's. In other words, a good salary, uh, they can choose their hours, they can work remotely, etc., etc., flexible hours, 
a pension, all the usual kind of bells and whistles that you might find in a job. So the question is, um, why are they actually joining the company? And if you're getting people who are willing to go the extra mile, they believe in the idea, they believe in you as a leader, then you're more likely not to have to fight to lose the talent as well. Um, and that is usually an introspective question as well, because the question is, are you that kind of person where people would actually go the extra mile for? Do they believe in the idea? Do they believe in the concept and the product or the service that you're trying to get out of the market? Um, is it or is it purely commercial? So I think there's probably a few, a few questions that would be asked before you get the, end up in a situation where you're worrying about the talent leaving as well. Um, if you've done your homework and you've made sure that at least you've done as much as possible to get the, the, the team in, but not there purely for commercial reasons or other you know, personal reasons, then you're more likely to retain the talent. The question then is, how do you maintain that talent and retain it uh, for future? And that's where you essentially give them opportunities to grow themselves as individuals. And this could be uh, growing themselves with soft skills, uh, growing themselves as human beings, growing, growing themselves at a technical level. But the idea is to give them a, a scope where they can evolve as uh, and actually become more mature as people and learn the skills they need to move into the next role. Um, I've been in scenarios where um, my manager for a previous organization has actually come back to work for me um, because we had that relationship previously. And it wasn't a, uh, a manager type relationship, it's the fact that we respected each other's talent and uh, we made sure that everybody has that scope to actually breathe and actually evolve as well. So it does work that way. Um, and the idea is that if you, if respect is usually earned, in my belief, so uh, you have to be in a position to earn the respect rather than commanding respect. If you're, if you're commanding respect, that is a very fickle and uh, it's not very, very long-lasting either. So there's a few things in there, uh, I think, um, that you'd look at before worrying about uh, the talent itself leaving. Hopefully that kind of sent you on to the question. Okay. Is there any, any other, anything else you'd like to add? I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll just be very brief. We're getting the buzz right here. Uh, I think the, the, the first thing is that you need to pay them fairly. So don't give me that crap, sorry, about people work for passion or people work for money. This is the number one, this is why I'm getting a job. So I want to be paid fairly. I don't have to be on the top end of the market. I'm not putting you on the lower end because of your passion, because you're so uh, you're that beautiful creature and you have the best app in the world, but pay people fairly, this is number one. Number two is to take, generally take care of people. I mean, we had one employee who we asked him, what do you want to do? I want to work here for the rest of No, really, what do you want to do? Well, I was left working for three to five years, and then I get a job at one of the big companies like Google, Microsoft. So I told them, let's help you do that. Let's help you reach that level. And alhamdulillah, he's still with us after seven years now. But we're generally helping him getting where he or she wants to go. So this is very important. When they felt our sincerity, they said that this is where I want to stay. The, the third thing is to be innovative, to have new tools and new tricks in your job, in your, in your, in your sleep, like well-being programs or others. I would give you one, one example of that that's very useful. This is the, um, you know, whenever you buy something new, you have a user manual. Make every one of your employees create their own user manual. Are you a morning person? There are some people who are very glorious in the morning. There are very, some people who you should not talk to them the first hours of the morning until they get their coffee, drinks, tea, lunch, whatever. There are some people who are night owls, super duper doers at evening, and there are people who just sleep at, at night. So give me, tell me how do I deal with you? Tell me what's the best communication. Don't send me emails, I don't like them. Send me a WhatsApp, I love WhatsApp. WhatsApp is my number of communication. Another person will tell you, never ever dare to cross my head and have my WhatsApp on your, on your phone. This is too personal, you, this is not personal. So put your employees, every one of them, one or two page, have a user manual and have their own teams read it and understand how can I deal with every one of them. So you deal with them in the right way and be a very active and adaptive. very much. It was a remarkable kind of discussion and we we'll give a big round of applause to these amazing speakers. Thank you very, very much.